What up? What up? What up, world? We are back. Friday night mocks in the house. I have a incredibly special guest here. Right to my well, left, right. It's Dave Klugly. How are you today? I'm doing great, man. Always, uh, always down to mock draft and talk some football. So thank you for having me. Excited to to to, to go through this mock draft and see who I end up with. I was uh, checking. I was the last one to join the mock, so I uh, <laughs> I landed at the three spot. Oh, all right. I yeah. thought I had seven, but I'll, I'll take three. I like that. No, you lucked out because I dropped all the way to the eleventh. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for those who don't know, Dave, Dave is a writer for Football Guys. You can check him out exclusively there on their website as well as on YouTube. He's on there what four times a four times a week? We were saying, yeah, I'm hosting three shows, and then I got my short videos that I'm doing as well. And then obviously, you can find all of my uh, stuff. I just tell everyone nowadays, just follow me on Twitter, and you'll see what I'm up to because that's where you can see where I'm guesting on shows and any random podcasts that I'm doing. You can see all my information there. I try to put out, you know, pretty actionable content on my Twitter, along with some stupid jokes that I, I tend to think are funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of them are, I, I think you had one with, uh, what was it? Adam uh, Colger? Col- Koffler. Koffler. There we go. Yep. Good yeah. friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah. He, I've seen a few of your back and forths with him, uh, to, you know, the last few days, which I, I've, I found entertaining. So <laughs> make sure you guys check out Dave. His Twitter handle is right there underneath. Um, so definitely check him out. Give him a follow. I've been following him for the last few weeks and enjoying every minute of it. Uh, let me get into the mock. Let's get everybody set up up here and introduce everybody. Of course, we have OG in the house. Dem boys, one of our first and always there for us. We got in the two seed, my brother. Jay Birdie, what's going on, Jay? Hope you're enjoying. Hope you have fun. Say hi to the little guy for me. And we got Dave at the three. We got Flag Dog in the four. We got Ravery in the fifth. We have good old Brandon right here in the chat saying, let's go. And then we have the Gouch. Gouch is overseas right now in middle uh, in the Middle East and fighting for us. So thank you so much for what you do. We appreciate your service. Um, we got FF Tycoon in the house. Love having Tycoon here. We got the one and only Gus Bus. If you ever want to do a mock draft, Dave, I will suggest if you ever want to mock draft, like literally every hour on the hour, Gus will have a literal mock draft set up for everybody. So check him out. Uh, he's definitely, you know, send him a request. He'll do anything you want. Um, we got Martin in the house from the Dynasty Pylon. Always enjoy having Martin. He's going to have his stream going on as well. Um, he's he's one of the best for IDP and stuff. We had him on last week with uh, FF420 as well. So always enjoy having him. And, of course, in the 12, we got the one and only Wilson, one of our ambassador extraordinaires, doing the best job ever. He is always around and doing something for us. Uh, so really glad to have him here. We're going to get this mock started so that everyone's been waiting all day for this we're doing a super flex mock uh super flex mock today full ppr um and i think we're doing three wide receiver spots if memory serves me right so that should be fun to do as well and so this is redraft right not dynasty oh this is not yeah this is this is redraft no dynasty here love it not we're we're, we're well past that <laughs> especially this time of year yeah oh my god yeah and that was like what two three weeks ago where they or no yeah two three weeks ago dynasty was everything or no april wow are we there are we it's really after the July? after the draft you get like wow. another like two to three weeks of dynasty season and then it turns into redraft season yeah it's incredible uh we got dem boys in the house saying what up get right fam welcome dave looking forward to drafting with you tonight Let's get this party started. Anthony, of course, in the house. Hope those sleeves are rolled up. Going to be a good one. And then Wilson goes, I wonder if uh, we could get Dave to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah, no doubt. What is it? Yeah. Drop me the link uh, and I'll right, do it right now. Yeah, get right Fantasy Network, of course. I'll send you the link if you need it. And then uh, we got Dustin in the house. What up, guys? What's going on, brother? <laughs> Brandon going Gus Bus, the sleeper legend, of course. Like I said, he truly, if you are, are ever looking for a mock, he will have it ready for you. He does them all the time. Um, so 
let's get into the fun news. The big news of this whole week is, of course, Baker Mayfield getting traded to the Carolina Panthers for a contemporary fifth round pick. Could be a fourth uh, based on, you know, starts and all that fun stuff um, for 2024, which is literally nothing. Um, you know, Warren Sharp tweeted out before the show, the Panthers really traded away a second, a third, two fourths, a fifth and a sixth for Sam Darnold, Mayfield and Matt Corral. I, I just, I, I sit here and I just can't, I, I just don't understand it. Like, can yeah. you explain that to me at all? I, I, I think, I mean, I think from a football standpoint, it makes much more of a, a of a wave than it does from a fantasy football standpoint. And, you know, immediately I saw these people throwing out takes that, you know, oh, this is great for DJ Moore, Christian McCaffrey through the roof, yada, yada, yada. I don't really think it is it moves the needle fantasy wise as much, but I think that Baker is a much better quarterback than anybody that they've played with in recent years. I mean, he's a clear upgrade from Sam Darnold. So I think this helps them get some more wins. But I think that Overall, you know, I don't think Baker's the type of guy that's going to be supporting this high-flying offensive air raid attack. So, um, you know, I'm not getting especially excited about Terrace Marshall or, you know, DJ Moore might find the end zone a couple more times, but he's still at that, you know, wide receiver one, wide receiver two bubble for me. I think the one guy that it does move the needle for me a little bit, and only because he was completely off my radar before, is Rashad Higgins, who had a really strong connection with Baker Mayfield back in Cleveland. There might be some sort of Rashad Higgins reemergence now, um, you know, with the um, implied tension between Robbie Anderson and uh, Baker Mayfield, there's a chance that Rashad Higgins can step in and be that, uh, you know, deep to intermediate threat for, for Baker. Yeah. That's crazy that you mentioned the Robbie thing. Uh, You know, before we came on the show, I was looking around and uh, I don't know who exactly it was, but uh, they did or Lamar did actually, you know, retweet and he was tagged and it was opposed to him throwing routes to Robbie Anderson. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it, I, I got to thinking, I'm like, this is, you know, the wide receiver room is kind of weak out in, out in Baltimore. They only got, you know, uh, Rashad Bateman. And, you know, he did say no and then kind of went on a show with Brandon Marshall and said, no, no, it's just the fact that it would be a new chemistry that I have to do with Baker. And, uh, I, you know, yeah, backtrack, I, backtrack, backtrack. Yeah, exactly. So maybe like, would this be a good move for them? Um, yeah, I think it's a good move from a fa- football perspective. Like I said, you know, I think that they can get a couple extra wins with Baker than they could with Sam Darnold. But, um, you know, fantasy wise, it just really doesn't do much for me. You know, I was looking at Robbie Anderson or not Robbie Anderson. I had DJ Moore as my wide receiver 16 and my immediate gut reaction was cool. I get to move DJ Moore up a little bit. And then I started looking at who was ahead of him. Yeah. I was like, no, I, I can't move him up. Like this is still yeah. Baker Mayfield's wide receiver one. And he's still probably going to be a high end wide receiver two at best. Yeah, I agree. You know, it, it's. It's one of those things where I just, when the news came about, I mean, of course, Twitter broke um, and it just was incredible. I looked at the numbers anyway. I mean, for them to get rid of him, trading, cutting him, whatever, it doesn't really do much. He, I mean, they're 21 million above the cap. That He's 10 million of that, which is insane. Uh, Robbie Anderson is 10 million for the cap, which is insane to think that they're above the cap by 21 whatever the whole point is is that in this case giving them away doesn't really hurt but it doesn't really help and it makes it where they're in a very difficult you know they wouldn't be in a difficult situation but they would be kind of pressed to do it they don't really have much behind them anyway i i think it would just be a lateral move at the end of the day um so like you were saying before about dj moore um you know you you moved him up maybe a tad just because of the no, you kept him right. Couldn't, couldn't even move him up. I mean, couldn't it, even it move just, him. yeah, it, it doesn't move the needle enough for me. Um, let okay. me pull up my rankings right now and see exactly who it was. But like I said, I had him at wide receiver, um, 16, if I remember correctly. Um, pull yep. these up right yep. now. You're so on 16. Exact... Sorry, I have them up. <laughs> yeah, so wide receiver 16 and ahead of him, it's Deontay Johnson, Cortland yeah. Sutton, Tyree Kill. I mean, yeah, I can't put DJ Moore ahead of those guys. Yeah. I just can't. No, and, and I've always had a really rough time with DJ Moore, even from the beginning. Um, I made a trade with my brother a few years ago when I picked him. I drafted him and in Dynasty, and I ended up trading him away. Um, you know, he was a little expensive at the time because it's a salary cap Dynasty League. And, you know, I, I felt comfortable giving him away. And I still feel comfortable with the fact that I don't have him anymore. So it, it is what it is. I, I've never been really, you know, crazy high on him. And it's because they haven't had a... Uh, they haven't had a quarterback to really make them worth it. Um, you know, so of course 
DJ Moore is one of the options. The other option is CMC. Does this move him up to you? I, I understand that for 90% of the consensus out there, he's 101, 102. Do you think he takes over that spot or no? I mean, I had moved him up to my 101 a couple of weeks ago, so I already had him there. I can't move him any higher than I've already got him. Well, of course. Um, yeah. From the consensus, though, yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen it. I've done a... I don't know if you guys do a lot of underdog drafts. I know oh, you're, you're big in uh, mock drafts. I have about 12 right now, and I'm in one of yours, too. <laughs> awesome. Love to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I, I am always in underdog drafts. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, they just opened up their puppy tournament today, and I did uh, 15 of those entries, and I saw CMC go number That's one awesome. in quite a few of them. That's crazy. And honestly, they are a friend of the show, which I'm glad that they are. And, you know, might as well push this out while I have a minute. Make sure you guys check out and use promo code Get Right right there if you guys use that they'll match you and like you know like dave said they have they have puppy tournaments right now five dollars a piece like come on now five thousand to the winner yeah so that's that's crazy if you're not in one of those try to be in as many as you can um you know it, it's definitely worth it i got into one today i saw i saw a guy draft <laughs> in the sixth spot or fifth spot dra they drafted aaron Rodgers, <laughs> and i went might be getting a refund on that one. Well, but then what did they do in the second round? They drafted, <laughs> they drafted like Russell Wilson or some other big name tight end or not tight end, uh, uh, quarterback. And then they draft a tight end and then they draft a quarterback. And then their first running back is Tony Pollard. Yeah, and... so there's a good chance you're going to get a refund on that. I, I've been in a couple <laughs> of those before. It really, I'm, I'm not even joking. If somebody oh, really? watches their draft that terribly, um, underdog will give you a refund and basically just throw that entire oh, wow. draft away. Because, I didn't know that because it could be a type of collusion. You know, it's a big tournament with a lot of money on the line. And, and what will happen is people throw a few people in there and um, have, uh, you know, one or two people purposely sabotage the draft, helping other people load up on their rosters. And then it makes it unfair to everybody else in the tournament. So underdog will step in if somebody really goes out of their way and botches it like that. And uh, you might be looking at a refund. <laughs> Interesting. I've never seen, I ne one, I didn't know that. And two, that's amazing. Wow. Now, the one thing I want to point out, just looking at this board really quickly, this is a super flex draft, and there are only two people that started off QB QB. I'm kind of surprised by that. Yeah. Yeah. And I was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, it's kind of strange. Uh, a lot. We, we've we been – this group is probably one of my best groups. I literally try my best. I, I tried my best this week to get literally the best of the best that I had. I knew you were coming in. I told them you were coming in. I wanted them. I told everybody I want the best, and they're giving it. They're giving it their best, man. And and we grad we grade these every Monday night. So you know we're gonna be back here on Monday grading everybody's mocks, seeing how everybody did, um, giving a you know giving our input on how we feel about everybody's draft. We'll definitely ask you at the end how you feel about a few of these. Um, not I'm not gonna have you go through every single one. That's just gonna take you forever, and you know you got things to do. Um, I, I love talking about my drafts as I'm making them. I mean, the one thing I'm kind of <laughs> happy about, and, and I reach for him just a little bit in my rankings, I've got Leonard Fournette ahead of Aaron Jones, but you okay. know, I've got them in the same exact tier and pretty excited to, you know, get Aaron Rodgers, who I am much higher on than the consensus and then link him up with his wide receiver one and Aaron Jones. Agreed. No, that's awesome. I was actually going to ask you about some of your, uh, you know, some of your particular rankings compared to EC, uh, ECR. I mean, you're huge. You're, you have Leonard Fournette at running back four. Mm -hmm. I just I can you tell me why? Yeah, and I, I've got a twenty five hundred word article on it that, that oh, I'm not even welcome to check out. I didn't well. get to there yet. <laughs> any, any, anytime I uh, anytime I have a big flag plant ranking like that, I make okay. sure to back it up with an article. You know, I don't want to just be throwing hot takes out in my rankings. But really, with Leonard Fournette, it just comes down to this guy being a three down back on a team that has one of the fastest pace of plays in the NFL. Uh, he catches passes. He gets the goal line work. I mean. The, the one thing that everybody's kind of knocked on him over the years is that he's injury prone. But if mm -hmm. you look at the last three seasons, he's actually played more games than the average running back. He's suited up for 86% of his games over the last three seasons. He had some struggles early on, um, but ever since then, you know, he's just been unstoppable. And and now when we look at who he's playing with, Giovanni Bernard is probably going to get cut. Yeah, and I know people are concerned about Rashad White, and I think that's why he's not getting looked at at the consensus as a top five guy. I mean, this guy was top five in every single receiving metric last year, efficiency, volume, you name it. But now people are concerned that Rashad White is going to cut into that receiving work, and I just don't see it. Okay. At this point in Tom Brady's career, 
what is more important than anything else is pass blocking. And Leonard Fournette at this stage in his career has become a phenomenal pass blocker. He saw more pass blocking opportunities than every other running back in Tampa Bay last year and gave up zero sacks. Meanwhile, Giovanni Bernard, Ronald Jones, Keyshawn Vaughn, they were all letting Tom Brady get hit. And because of that, that's why Leonard Fournette stayed on the field. And Rashad White, for as good as he is as a pass catcher, his biggest knock coming out of college was his inability to pass block. So I think long-term, there's going to be an opportunity for Rashad White to take over and be a fantastic running back. But this year, with Tom Brady being in his 40s and probably on his final leg, they're going to stick with Leonard Fournette. They're going to try to run it back. And they want Fournette in that backfield to protect Tom Brady. That's incredible. I mean, you know, I've been high on uh, for best ball, at least for, you know, uh, Ricard White. You know, he's someone I'm targeting just because of his, you know, PPR aspect. Um, But I for someone like Fournette, not that I don't think he has the talent. One, he's kind of screwed me a couple of times. So, of course, I have a little bit of pass bias for it. Um, But at the same time, I, I just for for me, I think I have. Where do I have him? I have him now at my, I think he was, I have him at 13, which I know is very low. And compared to guys, you know, Aaron Jones, Chubb, Barkley, Javante, you know, guys like that, that are a little, you know, just, they have a little more upside in my opinion. But I, after hearing that, I'm going to be um, definitely bringing him up a little bit uh, <laughs> just because like, that's, that's amazing. Uh, you're also high on Travis Etienne. And I'm only curious about Travis, one, for the injury. Um, I got to listen to the Fantasy Whispers yesterday. Uh, they were on with uh, Irwin, or Dr. Irwin, uh, or yeah. Edwin. Boris, yep. Yeah. So he was on, and, you know, he was saying, you know, how he felt okay about, you know, ETN. It, it's still, you know, he was doing his tiers of green, yellow, and, um, and red, and he's kind of in that bottom tier of yellow, but you know, right at that red mark, kind of. Um, so it's one of those things where, you know, I, I'm kind of questioning it because of that. You know, my, my fiance just had the Liz Frank injury. Doc said, I, career ender. And I even asked him about the ETN in the, in the thing. I know, bad. I, I mean, don't know eight why. Eight years ago did. when ACL was a career ender, right? And then uh, I, I, I agree. Peterson came back stronger than ever. And then we had an Achilles was a career ender. And Agreed. Then, Sam Akers comes back in less than a year, and we saw Deonta Foreman coming off the Achilles injury, crushing it last year. And then Liz Frank injuries. We've even got a decent recent sample size of people coming back from Liz Frank injuries. Most recently, well, not most recently, but most notably would be Julio Jones, who had a Liz Frank injury and had it repaired. And then the season after coming back from Liz Frank injury, he went off for 1,200 yards off. and almost, I think it was 10 touchdowns or something like that. Hollywood Brown was another guy that had to undergo Liz Frank surgery coming out of college and he got off to a slow start as a rookie, but you know, it it doesn't seem to be slowing him down at all now. So it's one of those things where I think that they're, you know, there's still this outdated thinking where people think that it is a career ender. And I am just not seeing that. I mean, we were already seeing videos of him cutting and running all over camp. And that's kind of what I was saying early on in the off season in February, March, April, I was saying, go out and get Travis Etienne now because you can get him in dynasty for a middle second round pick. You can get him in your startup in the sixth or seventh round. As soon as a video comes out of him running, he's going to skyrocket an ADP. And that's exactly what happened. OTAs opened up and he jumped from the sixth round all the way up to the third round. Yeah, no, it's incredible. I mean, I, 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 I'm starting to warm to it a little more and a little more. I mean, I, you know, it's one of those things where I, I tend to, I'll hear something like that and it'll affect me a little bit. And then I see it and then it's like, Oh wait, no, this should be fine. You know, uh, the doc was basically saying like for pass catching wide receivers and oh, pass catching running backs and wide receivers, it's a little bit easier to come back from. So for him, it might be a little difficult if, you know, he, but the, the, the whole point is, is that he might not get all the full workload that people might think he is the volume that he'll, you know, people are anticipating because of James Robinson coming back from the, you know, from the Achilles injury. Um, so for me, it, it's just hard to imagine him getting a full workload and being that third round value, but it, it's still not bad. I mean, you're still getting him at 15, you know, running back, what, 15, 10, something like that. Um, oh, right now, I believe he's still going. I, I want to say I have him at 19, at but you guys, you guys have him at, or you have him at what, 15? 
yeah, I'm a little bit higher than him. Um, but but again, I might be below consensus on him at this point. I mean, with the way that he's been shooting up, um, let me let me take a look at what his underdog ranking is because I'm seeing him consistently going in like the early to mid third at this point. Yeah. So th- there's a good chance that I'm below consensus on him now. I haven't updated my rankings in a couple of weeks, and that's that's really when he has started to spike in value. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, yeah, you know, and right now he is uh he's RB sixteen on underdog wow. right now, and um you know when I when I put him in, in my rankings at the time he was in in the low twenties, and and he's really really creeping up there now. It's getting harder and harder to draft him every day. Now we have a question from Wilson, and he's asking why is Dalvin Cook falling so far in this year's drafts? Why do you I think? tell you? Yeah, uh, of any guy know. with a first round ADP and underdog, I have more exposure on Dalvin Cook than anybody else. I'm taking him as early as 107, and right now he's wow. typically fallen to like 10 and 11. So I'm getting him on in, in a lot of my drafts because you got the the big five. You know, we're talking non super flex, of course. Uh, the big five is Chris McCaffrey, Jonathan Taylor, Jamar Chase, Cooper Cup, Austin Eckler, and Justin Jefferson. In some order or another, those are typically your top six, and then after that. People usually start going Najee Harris and Stefan Diggs and some other guys. I'm I'm smashing Dalvin Cook right there. I don't really understand why he's sliding the way that he is, especially with Kevin O'Connell coming in and revamping this offense. I'm expecting a lot more passing work for Dalvin Cook um, and just a better all-around offense, which is going to le- lend more scoring opportunities. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't really get the, the 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 consensus and industry fade on Dalvin Cook. Yeah, I'm I'm still trying to figure it out myself. Um, you know, I I agree with you 100%. You know, I do not understand it at all. Um, you know, Rafi saying in that in that system Cook will catch a ton of passes. I agree. You know, he's one of the better cat, you know, pass catchers out there, you know, and he's definitely one of the better pass, you know, blockers, uh, you know, compared to Madsen. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's one of those things where I completely agree. Um, and I think hard. that could be the other concern too. Um, you know, you talk about Madison. Madison is a phenomenal football player, oh, and they got sure. Kenny Wango as well, who is just you know this, this guy can fly on the field. So I think that might be a little bit of a concern because if you look back at um, how they utilized running backs in Los Angeles, and I don't know if this was Kevin O'Connell or Sean McVay making the calls, but they really go with the hot hand approach. I mean, it took Cam Akers; he had to fend off uh, Malcolm Brown for almost an entire season before he got his opportunity. And then last year, Daryl William- or Daryl Henderson slowed down a little bit, and they yeah. immediately just you know pulled the work from him. And and so I I think that might be the concern. But with how much money is being committed to Dalvin Cook, they're not just going to not feed him the ball. Oh yeah, for sure. And and I don't understand. Ah. Oh my heart who you were hoping for well i didn't think he'd come back but at the same time i went for waddle instead and i don't know why i did that um i'm still getting i still don't like sleepers adps and where they list everybody but some people just are better at it than i am and i need to get better at it yeah and and my thing is right now i mean i'm not even going off a sleeper adp i mean i am but i have done um i've already over 150 underdog drafts deep this off season (laughs) so i've got underdog adp memorized pretty much at this point and um yeah it's definitely interesting seeing how much adp shapes the way that players are drafted because there's players that are getting drafted now that wouldn't even be getting touched at this point in underdog drafts and vice versa there's guys that are sliding that i'm really surprised to see still on the board um, so it's always funny when you're drafting on different sites, you know, people say, don't adhere to ADP, go out and get your guys. But Great. at the end of the day, ADP does play a very strong factor in where players are getting drafted. Oh yeah. I want my value pick. I want that pick where, you know, if I see, I, I, I had one the other day what, that I did with the whispers and I saw Dallas Goddard and it was like the 10th round or 11th round. And I'm like, or yeah, something like that. And I'm like, sure. Like if you're not going to do it, I will like, yep. you know, it took that long for me to, you know, cause I, I, as a, you know, a typical way of doing things, I usually like to punt, you know, if we do one QB or anything like that, I like to punt the, the quarterback and the tight end. And, you know, I'll, I'll get somebody with decent value at the end. I'll draft the rest of my group high super flex. I've kind of done a little bit of both. I like doing it your way a little bit more. I kind of took a sidestep cause it, you know, we have three wide receivers. I figured why not? But after doing that, I realized that I'm in a I'm in a crap spot now. I had to go with Daniel Jones for my number two. But someone like your build, you have somebody like Lamar Jackson. You have Aaron Rodgers. You have a perfect stack of wide receivers that I wish I went for. You know, like Michael Pittman, Cortland Sutton, Allen Robinson, who another person that we could talk about real quick, which I completely understand the reasoning. And I'm behind you on this one. 
is you have him at wide receiver 11. And, and again, I've got an article out on this guy. Incredible. <laughs> no, and and honestly, that's I, I agree with you. And I don't even have to read your article to know why. This guy was a wide receiver one everywhere that he's been. He is a top receiver going on a top offense with a uh, – you can argue all you want about Matthew Stafford. He is probably one of the best, and I'm, I'm surprised if he doesn't get into Canton. He's one of those guys that just has that something about him that makes you feel like he could. And teaming up with a guy like Cooper Cup, I mean, it, it's it's a no brainer. I think he's a huge upgrade from Robbie, you know, Robbie Woods. And you know, it's I, I'm not and, surprised. And, you know, people. Uh, there's so many just like visceral gut reactions that people have when they hear Allen Robinson, especially after the season that he had last year with the draft capital that he commanded in fantasy. And then the way that he let managers down with his finish outside of the top 80. So I understand why people are fading him, but there are so many reasons not to, if you can just look behind the numbers. Um, I mean, first of all, if you were following me on, on, uh, on Twitter last off season, I put out a take that people said I was galaxy braining. I got so much flack for saying this, but I said, <laughs> go draft Allen Robinson and keep him as long as Andy Dalton is the quarterback. And then as soon as Justin Fields takes over, trade Andy Dalton or okay. trade Allen Robinson away. Tra- yeah, trade everybody him, yeah. said, you're crazy. What are you talking about? Justin Fields is a huge quarterback upgrade. And just schematically, you know, and how this no, was going to work out. I Andy didn't, Dalton is a guy. No. And, and, and the way that I looked at it was, you know, Andy Dalton, first of all, he was getting the reps with Allen Robinson in the offseason. Justin Fields and Allen Robinson got no reps together at all, which was just a mind-numbing decision by Matt Nagy that I'm not even going to get into. But what <laughs> it is, you know, Andy Dalton is a veteran, and he trusts guys to make contested catches. That's not something a lot of rookies do. And Allen Robinson, at this point in his career, is not an elite separator. He's somebody who really gets his by excelling at contested catches, attacking the ball at the catch point. That's what he does best. And Justin Fields didn't have that trust and chemistry and rapport with him. so. Wouldn't you know it? Week one, when Andy Dalton was healthy, 28% target share went to Allen Robinson, 11 targets total. In that same game, Darnell Mooney pulled a 5% target share. And then week two, Allen Robinson comes out and he is still the lead receiver with Andy Dalton. And then Andy Dalton tweaks his ankle, hits the sideline, Justin Fields steps in, and that was it for Allen Robinson. They had no chemistry working whatsoever. Uh, Justin Fields started hyper targeting Darnell Mooney. And from there, you could just see it every single week. Allen Robinson was just checking out more and more. And, and, and I, you know, there were some contract concerns there and tensions with the team. So he was already frustrated as is. And then for him to go out and just be asked to run curl routes and not getting any targets, you could just see him week to week just throwing in the towel. And, and it kind of culminated in just a terrible season all around. But what people are quick to forget is that Allen Robinson is still 28 years old. He is younger than Cooper he Cup. Is. Also, yeah. this team in Los Angeles has a long track record of supporting two very good wide receivers. Even when Jared Goff was the quarterback, they were supporting two wide receiver ones at the time. When Robert Woods went down with his injury last year, Cooper Cup was the overall wide receiver one, and Robert Woods was the wide receiver 12. They were both putting up wide receiver numbers. Odell Beckham, who was written off as dead in Cleveland, showed up, and it took him a couple weeks to get up to speed, but Towards the last few games of the season and through the playoffs, Odell Beckham was crushing it and completely rejuvenated his career. So I think that it's just so easy to see the writing on the wall that Allen Robinson shows up in Los Angeles, takes over that wide receiver two role, sees 120, 130 targets from Matt Stafford and puts up wide receiver one numbers. That I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I've been on that bad. Yeah, you know, I've been basically on the uh, caboose of your bandwagon for quite, you know, at least this offseason. When they made that move, in the off season, I was just like, holy crap, that's probably one of the best moves they could have made. Um, you know, to segue from Allen Robinson and who you were talking about with Justin Fields, you mentioned that, you know, someone like Justin Fields has as much upside as Trey Lance. Um, so why do you think that after, you know, everything is, oh, I have an auto pick. <laughs> Oops, that's okay. I get Cooper anyway. Um, you know, in so you mentioned the fact that he is, you know, just as much upside as Trey. Why? Because I, honestly, I didn't see it in college coming into the pros. I actually was very low on Justin Fields in general. I didn't want to touch him. So, well, I think that there's this misconception that Justin Fields isn't a runner and and he was never asked to run when he was in college because his team was literally going through the regular season undefeated and he was sitting in the second half of games he didn't need to run but he put up over 400 yards rushing last year on uh you know less than half a season but 
really, um, you know, what, what it is for me is that he was kind of forced to play a little bit earlier than he should have been. You know, everybody said that Justin Fields was a guy that was going to benefit from getting some time on the bench, um, you know, kind of learning behind Andy Dalton and then getting plugged in some point in the midseason. Like I talked about when talking about Allen Robinson earlier, Andy Dalton tweaked his ankle in week two. Justin Fields was forced into the lineup. And yep. wouldn't you know it? He sucked and he looked terrible. And then I he agree. came out the next week and he still sucked. And the next week he was still terrible. And it took him some time to get up to speed. But if you look at his last four games of the season, he was a completely different player in his final four starts. In his first three starts, 56% complete, or in his first six starts, 56% completion, an interception per game, 134 passing yards, and 30 rushing yards. In his last four starts, he boosted his numbers up to 63% completion ratings, 1.25 touchdowns per game, 244 passing yards, and 64 rushing yards per game. Now, that's a pretty small sample. We're only looking at four games here. But if we extrapolated that over the entire season last year, that would have been the QB4 overall in fantasy behind, wow. you know, Josh Allen and just uh, Herbert and Brady. I mean, we were looking at elite numbers on a pretty small sample size towards the end of the year. So I, I think now with a new offense, you know, having a full offseason, knowing that he's going to come in as a starter, the ceiling is just so high for Justin Fields this year. And like I said, you know, he wasn't asked to run a lot in college and he wasn't asked a lot to run last year, but he's got the ability to run. And I think we see that a lot more now in 2022. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I still don't. I, I'm still not behind it. I didn't see anything that impressed me with him. Um, I'm looking at my team and I'm a little upset that I did auto because normally I would have gone with Gabe Davis right now. And uh, we won't talk about Gabe Davis, I promise, just because uh, I know for the last like three days, four days, maybe last week. Or last two weeks, everyone has literally not stopped about Gabe Davis. So we won't get into him today. Um, just I'm all, uh, all I'll say is I'm the conductor on the train for that one. Um, but in this case, for Justin Fields, I just never saw it on the field and that you know at all. Even when he was on the field and did well, I just didn't see it. Like it, you know, like when you're watching somebody and you just know like they're good. Like Carson Wentz, I've never been a big fan of. Watched him in Indy saw him go to the very end of like one of the games. I, I forgot what game it was off the top of my head, but he looked like an elite quarterback. He looked like that guy that threw that, you know, could sling that ball in there without a problem right on a dime. So he's always just not him in general, but you know, you could just see it. He has that it factor about him. I just, I haven't seen that from Justin Fields in my own opinion. Like I get the numbers are there. I just, I can't get behind it. I've always been a, one, I, I can't stand running quarterbacks because of the concept that they have more risk involved with everything just because they can get hurt easily. I understand Ooh, that. I, I'd recommend looking up uh, Adam Harstad actually debunked Ooh, okay. that theory a while back with an article that I quarterbacks might, are like 15 times more likely to get injured in the pocket than they are on the run. Just yeah. because they're standing still? They're standing still. They're getting hit low. Um, quarterbacks are wow. more likely to get injured in the pocket than they are when they're running. And, and and if you look at it, I mean, he broke it down. He went through the last like 40 years of data going all the way back to like Frank Tarkenton. Yeah. I mean, he went way <laughs> back on, on his on his data poll here. But, um, you know, it, it, it blew my mind. And that was one of the first things, you know, when I came into football, guys, I said something about that. And Adam Hart said quickly hushed me up with an article. And he said, no, read this. And it, it, it absolutely blew my mind. Yeah, I. Okay, I'll have to. I'll start having to change my mind. It's just so it's hard for me because a lot of the guys that pass the damn ball or that are statues in the pocket are a little bit more accurate with their throwing just because they're not moving as much. They have, you know, they can get the angle a little bit different. You know, Mahomes is one of those rare few, and Josh Allen and, you know, even Herbert, you know, they have the ability to run a little bit and kind of get out of pocket, but still know how to stay in the pocket and pass. You know, compared to guys like Lamar Jackson, who I'm not a big fan of just because of the concept that he is not as accurate as I would want him to be, but he can run a ton. So I get the floor. Fantasy wise, I completely understand it. As a real life quarterback, I think he sucks. That's just me, though. Um, Ooh, yeah. I just don't I just don't like it. I, I, I can I never got behind the Lamar like him, like the quarterback. Like, I, I just I don't I, I don't get it. Honestly, I like guys like Josh Allen who can do both. He's accurate with both. It's just me. It's a weird thing with me. And that's I, I will always not be a fan of Lamar Jackson. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, so Anthony's asking here, Dave, why do you think Stafford is being drafted so late in uh in underdog? 
because he just doesn't run. I mean, that that's all it is. The top six guys yeah. all have rushing upside. You're looking at Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts, Kyler Murray. All those guys run the ball. And then after that, I mean, you can kind of just shuffle all those guys up. Aaron Rodgers, Matthew Stafford, Derek Carr, Kirk Cousins, Tom Brady. I mean, I don't know if there's any really strong differentiators between any of those guys. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm a little bit lower on Stafford as well for that exact reason. Um, you know, the, this team's going to throw a lot, but, uh, you know, I yeah. just like the efficiency that you're getting from Aaron Rodgers. I think that uh, Derek Carr is going to throw uh, a little bit more than Stafford will. Um, and, and, you know, you think that there's going to be a lot of volume, but uh, Los Angeles, the Rams, they actually run a pretty balanced attack where they, yeah. they run, rush the ball quite a bit as well. So you're not just going to be looking at, you know, Brady type numbers where he's going to be throwing the ball 750 times. Yeah, them boys telling me Lamar QB three this year. He's my QB two. Yeah, I was just gonna say he's your QB two. I I saw that well before I came on the show. I was like, yeah, he's definitely not gonna like my take on it because <laughs> I had him. I think I have him at like eight, if memory serves me right. I think. So yeah, yeah, I just saw Victorious V took Al Lazard, and I, I was gonna take Lazard ahead of Brandon Ayuk, but with the weird sleeper ADP, I was hoping he might make it back to me. No. But yeah, Lazard at, at, at that pick. I mean, I, I've gone on and on about this guy, but it, at nine ten, that's such a steal. And underdog, I'm taking this guy in, in the seventh and not even thinking twice about it. Yeah, okay. Nah, I just got a little bit too uh, a little bit too hopeful that he might wrap back around to me. But I, I had my sights. I told on you this is a good crew here. here. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, uh, Martin, if you don't know, uh, he's like I said, he he's part of the Dynasty Pylon. Um, he does his own podcast, does a lot of IDP and Dynasty, um, and you know he's he's. You know, well, one, he's a Falcons fan, but at the same time, he he did a whole break uh, breakdown on uh, Green Bay recently. And that's probably why he went with Lazard. Just, you know, we all know the, you know, the narrative for it is, you know, <laughs> Rodgers hates those, you know, those rookies and all those people that he doesn't know. He'd rather work with somebody that he knows. I don't get it. OK, I get it in some ways, but why not? be a team player and try to go through it. That's my own thing. But either way, I, I understand why people are locking in on Lazard. So I'm assuming you're the Lazard, you know, Lazard, uh, Watkins and everyone else after that, or are you, are, is even Watkins on your, on that list? Um, uh, sorry. Who, <laughs> uh, are you talking about Christian Watson? No, I was talking about uh, Watkins. Oh, Sammy Watkins. Oh, no, Sammy he's, he's going to be cut the before week King. one. No, 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 no. <laughs> he, he's not even going to make it to week one. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw uh, – I forgot who it was that you were talking to. I think it was uh, Jeff Bell. Um, and he was mentioning something about Sammy Watkins. Or, I forgot I like, who it was. What team is he going to be on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you said, what team is he going to be on at the end? So, for me, ooh, spicy. I'm going to have to ask you about this. I'm just asking because it, you picked it. We all know about it. Deshaun, weird. I, I have to ask. You're that confident that he'll be at least six to, you know, the six to eight games that keep people keep yeah. whispering that it might be? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the rumors that we've got, the most recent report is that, um, you know, they uh, came to the NFLPA with a 12 game suspension and that the yeah. NFLPA said, no, we want less than that okay. and that they're still negotiating. So, the way I look at it, half a season of Deshaun Watson is better than a full season of about, you know, 28 other quarterbacks. So, um, yeah, he, he's a guy that oh, I've been fair. taking, especially in super flex leagues. I'll take him pretty late, um, you know, just kind of get through those first few weeks with what I've got. And then, you know, obviously this is a mock draft. We're not really playing here, but you use him as trade bait, throw him out there. Um, but really more than anything, I mean, just getting to plug a guy who, is a top three to top five quarterback get to plug him into your lineup for the playoffs is that hammer to get you through for a championship um I, i've been taking him late in, in a lot of drafts especially super flex okay i i'm yeah i i keep hearing i kept hearing the reports of you know they're looking for indefinite so like the minimum is one year and then i keep hearing uh we were, i was talking with kyle letterman uh a few weeks ago or Leiterman. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm really bad with last names. Um, I was talking to him the other day and he was saying the same thing that six to eight and, you know, they keep going back and forth, but legitimately it looks like it's going to be six to eight. You know, I, I, I was on a, um, a space with one of the basically Cleveland, uh, you know, everybody, I don't, I don't know the names in particular, but they were basically just going off on how it, it's, it's going to be, that six to eight or none 
at this point. We don't yeah, know. And I've heard that as well that he might just avoid suspension completely because he yeah. wasn't. And, and you know, I'm I'm not a lawyer. I don't I don't know all the specifics of this, but yeah, yeah from what I mean, I've been hearing, I mean, it just sounds every single day like that that total suspension. We went from two years to one year to half a year to six games to no suspension. I mean, it's certainly trending in that direction where it looks like we're going to see him on the field this year. Yeah, and 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 that's where I'm just <laughs> I I don't know what to do with him. You know, and it gets to a point where, like, I get it in best ball. Best ball, I understand. You have them, you know, you for best ball, you're only picking two quarterbacks at the most, most of the time. You know, some pick three because, you know, whatever they have. Like, maybe for those, you know, builds, you pick three. But at the end of the day, I, I just – it is he still worth it at the end of the, you know, the headache? But if you have an IR spot, I guess it's worth it, you know? Right. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, I'm I'm totally confident with Lamar Jackson and Aaron Rodgers. I've already got two studs here. So this is just kind of a, a lottery ticket that can no, true. push me in, push me on. And, and like I said, more than anything, if this was a real um, league and not a mock draft, whenever that suspension was up, whether it was after week four or after week six or after week eight, I'd immediately be putting Lamar Jackson, Aaron Rodgers and Deshaun Watson, throwing them all in the trade block and seeing what I can get for them. Interesting. Oh, that's a. That's an interesting strategy, honestly. Yeah, I'm, I'm a slimy salesman. Um, I, I'm, I was going to say, I just saw no, that no, the other I'm, day. I'm, I'm in the, the fantasy world now, but, uh, you know, previous life in corporate America, I was a salesman and and, and and I like to trade. Interesting. Interesting. That's good to hear. I can't wait to bounce some takes off you for uh, for my dynasty league. My brother's <laughs> watching, so I can't let him. Um, so, <laughs> so for, uh, Wilson, we have a question. He goes, Dave, what team do you like the most so far other than your own? And he's I'll be honest. I haven't that. really had a chance to look at others. I've kind of been hyper-focused on my team. Um, nice. let me, let me look through here real quickly and, and, yeah, you got and a see minute. if anything jumps out to me specifically. No, you definitely got a minute. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been having a rough go of this one. This is definitely not my best. Um, this is, I, I, I definitely don't like this build compared to what I've normally done in the past. I normally would like to go a little bit more, um, you know, get my quarterback early, grab my running backs, then go with my wide receivers, even if it's a three wide receiver. I guess, um, you know, you're you're beating yourself up a little bit, but I like that late Daniel Jones pick as a QB two, and then oh, Zach I love Ertz Daniel Jones. Yeah, Zach Ertz is my tight end five, so getting him where you got him, um, I, I'm taking him ahead of Goddard, ahead of Schultz, ahead of. Um, yeah, I had of those two pretty confidently. So I like that you were able to get a, a good value on him. Yeah. Those were the ones that I, you know, for something like this, hold on one sec. I'm still trying to gauge my pick here. Uh, let's try it. You know, my my um, favorite team is, uh, who's FLG underscore DG. Oh, that, flag that's dog. The one that jumps out to me. I, I really yeah. like that team. I think, and followed a pretty similar method to what i did you know starting off getting your running backs and your quarterbacks early smashing those mid-round wide receivers and we see it every single year where mid-round round, mid-round wide receivers a handful of them end up putting up wide receiver one numbers and dj moore could be that guy brandon cooks is a guy that everybody thinks is like ah, oh, he's a low floor guy he's gonna put up a thousand yards in the eight games that he started with davis mills last year he was pulling a 29 percent target share and 9.4 targets per game over an entire season that's 160 targets if he's getting 160 targets especially with where he draws them down the field he's putting up wide receiver one numbers he's got chris godwin here who obviously missing some time but chris godwin comes back in he's a plug and play wide receiver so i really like that team a lot okay and then mccaffrey fournette and etn are are three of my guys that I'm I'm extremely bullish on. So that whoever uh, whoever drafted that team, it's it's definitely jumping out to me. Always a big fan of Flag Dog. We I met him a few months or in this off season, and uh, you know in my mock, you know literally mocking every day, three out, you know three four a day. Um, got to meet him and uh, been enjoying every minute of him being here. Also a uh, retired vet as well. Um, mm-hmm. Love the. Love the Aaron Rodgers uh, face mask up in the face uh, logo for him as well. So always <laughs> been here. <laughs> and he actually said uh, in the chat uh, for Sleeper, he said, thanks, man. Enjoyed. Uh, he liked your take on his team. So um, that's great. Um, so I did have some other fun questions for you. And, you know, I didn't get to go through all your uh, rankings and all that fun stuff, uh, only the top stuff. But who are some players that you're a little bit lower on than consensus that, you know, people that not that you're like, don't draft them, but you're like, draft them a little bit later. 
Yeah, and, and I don't know if you auto pick this guy or if you pick pick this guy. So I, I, I I'm sorry. I auto pick, but Jalen Waddle. I, oh, I Waddle! No, I picked him. <laughs> and and I love Jalen Waddle, the player, but I just don't see. I mean, where he's getting drafted, I, I I don't know the exact number, but typically he's going, you know, around wide receiver fifteen to wide receiver twenty. And I just don't see any world where Tua Tagovailoa is going to be able to support two top twenty wide receivers on a run first offense. So I feel like you kind of got to pick your guy there. And and for me, it's Tyreek Hill, the guy that they gave one hundred and twenty million dollars to. Also Tyreek Hill, who was a running back in high school, you know, or else or in college, we're spending all this time trying to find out who the next Debo Samuel is going to be. It's probably going to be Tyreek Hill. He's probably going to get a lot of those short to intermediate routes as an extension of the run game. And I really like Waddle. It's tough to fade a guy that is coming off, you know, a thousand yards as after a rookie season. Yeah. But I just feel like he's going to be that odd man out in this offense, unfortunately, with uh, with Tyreek Hill there. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 that's where I was a little like, I think I'm a little bit biased from the end of last season in the context that he had those games. You know, he ended his rookie season with the most, you know, receptions for a rookie. And I understand he did it by himself. Well, essentially. And, did it with, you know, even with uh, Devontae Parker. So for me, I understand Parker's not anywhere in the realm of Tyree Kill, but I still think he's a, I think he's probably one of the better uh, low end wide receivers out there. Um, you know, I've, I've always been a fan of, of Parker until last year. Um, he goosed me against the uh, Saints and I no longer trust him. Um, <laughs> that was not a fun, I'm driving in the car. Week 17 or no, week 16, driving up to uh, upstate New York with my brother who had Jalen Waddle. I had Devontae Parker. I needed at least 20 points and uh, he took all of them. So I was not thrilled on that ride. It was a long ride. And uh, yeah, I'm going to get off that anyway. So who are some <laughs> other guys other than uh, Jalen Waddle that are just a little too high for you and that you're lower, you know, um, Amon or St. Brown is another guy that I just am not getting behind at all. And and I know you're probably like, why, why? No. like these rookies that had great rookie seasons, what are you doing fading these rookies? And I think there was just so much situation that led them to these really good rookie seasons. I agree. And, and I just don't think that he's going to be able to repeat. I mean, the big thing with Amon or St. Brown, you look at his splits uh, before TJ Hawkinson and DeAndre Swift got hurt. He was pulling a 14.5% target share after those injuries, his target share jumped up to 34%. He was pulling more targets or a higher target share than Cooper Cup was last year. Yeah. Then this team goes out and they sign DJ Chark. They trade up in the yeah. draft for Jamison Williams, Williams, who yeah. I almost took ahead of Isaiah Spiller. That was a that was a good pick by uh, by Jay Birdie fifty three there. Yeah. But um, you know, I, I just think that it's going to be such a crowded offense. Realistically, in my projections, I think Amandre St. Brown is going to be fifth in targets on this team, wow. and it's just uh, the the fact that he's going as a top twenty five, top thirty wide receiver is just way too rich for my blood. No, I, I can actually, I, I'm on board with that too. I think, you know, I think one person that's being incredibly slept on is DJ Chark in that offense. Mm -hmm. I, I am, I'm very shocked that his ADP in general is that low um, that you can basically get their wide receiver one for, you know, you can argue if Jameis Williamson will be that person once he gets there. But he, he his nine his nine month table. Oh, I think it yeah nine month recovery rate from ACL isn't going to be until like November of this year, if not December. So he's not coming back until maybe not until the end of the season. So it's one of those you know scenarios where I don't understand the drafting him in general. I get if you're going to put him on an IR spot at the very end of drafts, whatever that's fine. But I, I still don't understand it, but I completely agree with you with, you know, with Amon St. Brown. Yeah, he could be the number two or three or something like that. But who would you put as, you know, you were saying that he would be wide receiver five or, you know, the fifth. Well, in not wide receiver five, but Sorry. Hawkinson and Swift are going to be ahead of him. Swift, okay, that's, and then that's Chark is going to be ahead of him. Over the course of the season, I think that, you know, he probably finishes with more targets than Jamison Williams. But as soon as Jamison Williams comes in, my fear yeah. is that I'm honor St. Brown drops to fifth in the pecking order. Okay. All right. So fourth until he gets there. All right. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. But, I mean, and that makes complete sense. You know, and like you I said, think, I'm on board where, either way. Where Amandra St. Brown operated and found so much success last year um, was in the very short to intermediate parts of the field. I mean, we even yeah. saw him taking snaps out of the backfield and playing yeah. as a running back. 
And that was <laughs> directly correlated to when DeAndre Swift got hurt. And I mean, they just, Jamal Williams is the type of guy that has that sort of um, dynamic profile where he can do yeah. all of those extra things. Craig Reynolds was a guy I wasn't even familiar with until he popped up out of nowhere last year, if I'm being honest. <laughs> so Amandro St. Brown, you know, he just has that versatility where he can do those things. But the only reason he was used in that role is because DeAndre Swift was hurt. So all of those short to intermediate targets that he was gobbling up last year are going right back to DeAndre Swift. And if you look at his overall numbers, DeAndre Swift I'm talking about here, mm -hmm. they, they don't look quite as impressive because in the final two games of the season, he was very limited. And then he missed a handful of games before that. But if you look at the games just where he was healthy, he averaged more targets in those games than any other running back did in the NFL. He was averaging almost six targets per game. I mean, that is ludicrous numbers. So my my fading of Amandra St. Brown has so much more to do with me just loving DeAndre Swift than anything else. Um, the last thing I'll say about DeAndre Swift is that he's a fourth round rookie. And I know at a certain point, draft capital stops mattering, but yeah. the hit rate for these guys is just non-existent. I mean, in the last 20 years, the fourth round rookie or the fourth round wide receiver that has scored the most points over the por over the course of his career was Seashell Shorts. So, I mean, that's what we're looking at with Amon St. Brown is like best case scenario. Everything falls into place. His ceiling is Cecil Shorts. Wow. Yeah, I I don't get that. I, I, I don't understand why people like for me, I understand that I, one guy that's actually incredibly high on uh, Swift is uh, FF Tycoon, um, who is a good friend of the show, has his own with the fantasy boardroom on YouTube. Uh, really great channel. Great guy to watch great friend of the show and you know he's incredibly high on him i just can't get on board with it in any shape way or form for one of those top picks i don't i don't even think i have any of them in best ball um but it, did it you is see my, my swift ranking no and, I, and I actually just moved him down a few days ago i bumped alvin cook ahead of him yeah yeah um, i'm in seven he, uh in ppr he's my, my six yeah and I, i'm not yeah I think the fantasy pros ones, those might be a little bit messed up. I don't stay on top of those That's quite okay. as much. Football guys is where you can see my really up-to-date rankings. And um, that, you know, I've tweaked a little bit. So I think you might be looking at um, half I'm PPR, looking at but my full PPR yeah. rankings, Chris McCaffrey, number one, Jonathan Taylor, Austin Eckler, Leonard Fournette, Dalvin Cook, DeAndre Swift, Aaron Jones. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very bullish on DeAndre Swift. Okay. Yeah, I, I still got to maybe get on that train. I'm just, uh, I like guys, like I like Barkley a little more. You know, I like Harris over there. I love Mixon. You know, I'm pretty much – Mixon's probably one of my favorite. You you were having a conversation with Adam the other day that he was, you know, like, I'm not touching Mixon. I'm like, why? Yeah, his O-line – he literally – his O-line is literally increased from probably the worst in the league to the best in the league. They're, yep. I think on uh, Pro Football Focus, they, they have him as like the – I think the eighth ranked or something like that. They moved them way up. Actually, they, and another reason why that you could probably be on board with Swift, and they ranked the the uh, the Detroit Lions at five for their offensive line. Yep. They ranked them fifth, and I'm sitting mm -hmm. there like, who's on their line again? And I'm like, oh, that makes sense, <laughs> you know. And I, I get it. I'm, you, I'm a little you know, more. Some, sometimes you, you got to separate from you know the football player and the fantasy football player. I know, right? And realistically, you know, I, I'm one of Swift's biggest proponents. And last off season or last season during the year, I was tweeting about what a terrible rusher he was, and he was like he was objectively yeah. awful between the tackles last year. But he gets his points through the air, and and you just got to look at that passing. Like there, there isn't any other running back that's going to be seeing six plus targets per game, especially in a PPR league. That is just so valuable. And then you know you, um, drawing a blank on the guy's name, Dan Henry. Sorry, Dan Henry over at Football Guys just did a study, and a target is worth two point five times more than a rush is. So even if like if you look at his six targets per game, that's equivalent to 18 carries per game. I mean, he's getting a full rushing workload just through the air. Even if he's not touching the ball on the ground, he's still making up for it just with what he gets through the air. No, that's that's very interesting. I never I never knew that or even thought of that, you know, thought about it in that particular way. You know, especially for full PPR, half I'm assuming is a little bit less. Um, right. yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, that's, that's awesome. Um, I do have Cody asking was, uh, was talking with a friend last night about who is the better quarterback between Baker and Jared Goff. What do you guys think? <laughs> that's a good question, man. Oh, 
I mean, it, it's tough to compare the two because they're so different. Um, you know, Jared Goff is for both first a, round picks, first number one overall. First overall, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, Jared Goff is a technician on the short throws. Like he he's not going to miss those short throws. Another reason to like DeAndre Swift is he's just going to no, hit agree. DeAndre Swift nonstop behind the line of scrimmage. Um, but I think like if it's you know you need to win a game. I'm going with Baker just for the the big arm and and the heart and and the you know the the effort that he puts out on the field. Um, over the course of a season, I'd probably lean towards Jared Goff just because he's a little bit safer. But um, that that's a really good question. I like that one. I'm, yeah, I'm they're right about there for the next few days. Yeah, no, I for me, I'm automatically I'm gonna be I'm gonna put my flag on uh, Goff. Yeah, I and, just, and I think for fantasy, you'd put it on Goff too, just because. Yeah. I like. I don't the, even know like the team better. You look at the surrounding weapons too. McCaffrey and Swift, very comparable. DJ yep. Moore and and Amonra St. Brown, very. Yeah, that that's tough, man. That is that is a really tough question. RJ going with Baker. I. You want to know some? <laughs> and and this is. I heard this too on uh, a Cleveland talk, and they were saying, you know, Cleveland's line, horrible. Not Cleveland. Sorry, Carolina's line. They're not yeah. that great. Austin Colbert is their best guy. <laughs> and, you know, I understand that completely. I am on board understanding that their line is trash. And, you know, the Lions have a, a essentially a better line. And you could maybe argue better coach, too. Um, you know, so a lot – coach is a big deal in a lot of ways. And, you know, I I am not the biggest fan of Ben McAdoo. Um <laughs> As a, as a Giants fan, I <laughs> as wouldn't expect you to be. Giant. No, I was I was angry as could be uh, about the Eli thing. Uh, I'm thankful that I got to go to Eli's last game, which I was very um, honored to be at. Um, got to see him play against the Dolphins and win. Uh, I actually he uh, tweeted the other day his first win at Giant or at MetLife Stadium. Uh, he you know his first game there he won, and I brought it up that. He won the last game too, so um, you know I I I always always have respected Eli Manning. So for me, it's it's very tough to have that whole. He had a that the streak starting streak going and could have beat fought. You know he could have he could have beat. Uh, he could have outdid Brett Favre, and it's just uh, sorry. It's just a it's a a hurt thing. But I also don't like Matt Rule. I don't think he has anything worth it like i don't think he's any i don't think he's that good in any shape way or wish, form I, I wish they I, I hate that joe brady became the scapegoat because i'm such a big joe brady <laughs> fan and for him to be the scapegoat and him to get cut out of carolina I, I was really hoping that joe brady was going to end up in chicago but you know it seems like after being the scapegoat in carolina and getting cut there uh, we, we went out to see him with an nfl job for a few years and that's sad i mean i also hated what he did last year with the quarterbacks in general Sam Darnold goes down, and what do they do? Quarter like the the quarterback carousel of Cam Newton, PJ Walker, and then when Sam Darnold came back, they still did the same damn thing. I just don't get it. And so for me, I just I have to plant my flag on Goff. He's in a better situation, better team, better you know scenario. I think he's a better quarterback. Just in general, I know Baker is younger, you know, to an extent. Maybe I I have to double check, but either way. I think they're I, the same age. I, they I could might be wrong, be, right? but I, I want to say they're I'm going to look age. right now. I'm looking yeah, I'm, right I'll, now. I'll look up Baker's age. You look up Baker's age. Baker's 27. 20, oh, they're the same age. That's what I okay. thought, yeah. Uh, uh, then I'll go with Goff. Be, I don't know. I, yeah, I can, I can Trubisky find in it. the conversation, too. And let's just make oh, it a, my God. A, a please, let's not game. throw Trubisky in. <laughs> I, I'd be the first one to say no to Trubisky. <laughs> I, and I picked him like I he's on my I, I I drafted him on my team and I still and it was only because I had no other option. You know, I, I was doing a I was actually doing a puppy draft today and I it was a, a quick one, actually. And when I was doing it, it I completely auto drafted and I'm like, oh, no, I don't have two quarterbacks. And I didn't think to, you know, I was like, oh, crap, I have to go pick someone. And I go to look Keep and I'm grown. like. No, I had Daniel Jones. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even realize I had Daniel Jones already. I thought I had to pick from Carson Wentz. And I'm just like, or not, oh, not Carson Wentz, uh, from Mitch Trubisky. And I'm like, oh, I mean, no. I, I, I'm totally okay punting on QB2 in, in best ball and taking Davis Mills in the 17th round. Oh, I'd I would rather so, take Davis Mills. So much Davis Mills this year in, in best ball. It's just, 
I mean, even if I have two quarterbacks, if I don't have one of those, you know, top six, top seven guys, if I only have two quarterbacks and they're both kind of shaky, I'll, I'll take a QB three in Davis Mills. I, I no, love me that too. guy. I'm a big fan of Davis Mills. I, I thoroughly enjoyed his first game. And it, I remember it was like a Monday night or Thursday night game comes out. I just remember it was prime time. I remember he came out, had a great game. I thought he did real well. They had like, he was going against one of the best defenses, you know, defenses in the league. I forgot what, I forgot what the matchup was, but he looked incredible. Like he, he stayed in the pocket, got hit through the ball, caught, you know, whoever, you know, whoever he threw to caught it. Like he, he just had that thing that, you know, like I was saying before with quarterbacks, he had that little bit of, extra oomph to it he had that accuracy i just i think you, he's going to be great you talk about the accuracy um you know he had two yeah. games where he came in in the second half and kind of had to play clean up and, and he was terrible in those two games but in the 11 games that he started his uh completion percentage in those 11 starts would have been the best of any rookie in nfl history yep so i mean I they, 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 they're, they're, there's a huge ceiling with davis mills that i think people aren't really tapping into yet no, I'm I'm excited, and they actually have a decent supporting cast. I'm not saying that they have the best in the world because they don't. Brandon Cooks, young. yeah. Well, except I mean, for outside Brandon of Brandon Cooks. Cooks, yeah, but Nico <laughs> Collins, Brevin no. Jordan, John Mechie, they've got a lot of guys that could pop on that offense. And I, I'm, excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm mm-hmm. excited for that team. The uh, they and they picked up a a tight end too that no one's heard about. I forgot the guy's name because, of course, I forgot about him. But I heard that they drafted some guy that is incredibly, you know, up there in tight end status. Like he's not, uh, you know, not he's Brevin not Jordan. Yeah. Bourbon Jordan. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he's, he's a phenomenal pass catcher, which is kind of weird. They used him in line so much last year, but he's a guy that can kind of play that like David Njoku, Mike Gusecki type of yeah. tight end where he lines up in the slot. Fantastic pass catcher, a little bit undersized. And they just utilized him so weird last yeah. year. So I'm hoping that he gets uh, some more routes run this year. Yeah, I mean, they let go of Jordan Akins that was there last year. They kept him instead. So Giants picked up Jordan, of course, but mm-hmm. he'll probably be on the roster bubble and cut just because they love Bellinger so much because that's literally all they talk about on uh, anything yep. Giants related. It's yep, I've insane. heard, yeah. You know, and I, I get the backing of Steffi once in a while where she, she will back me. <laughs> she loves Bellinger, man. She yeah, does I know. not stop talking about him. Oh, I can imagine. And I, I see her post about it consistently. So believe me, I, I definitely I am definitely on board with that. Um, so we just talked about guys that you're lower on consensus, but you have no problem with taking here and there if you know value or whatever. Who are guys you are definitely just just don't even touch? Guys that you are not trying to draft at all. And I'm I'm a volume drafter. I, I do, especially best ball. Like I do hundreds and hundreds oh, and course. hundreds of drafts every offseason. So I will draft anybody if the price is right. Um <laughs> that, that's a tough question, man. Um I mean there's, there's a few guys that like like Tier McLaurin is a guy that I don't have almost any exposure on right now. And like if okay. he slides like a round and a half, I'll take him, but he, he's not a guy that I'm really looking at at, at ADP. He's just, you know been inconsistent and i don't think that there's any sort of boost there with carson wentz you know they've been talking about this guy cracking in a wide receiver one territory since he came into the league and he just perennially puts up low end wide receiver two numbers so i'm not too crazy about him i guess one guy that i'm not drafting at all zero percent exposure on michael thomas and people are still okay, holding good. on to hope that michael thomas is going to come back no it's not happening just just uh take those dreams and and, <laughs> and put them down and, and tuck them away it's it's not going to happen there's michael thomas is not playing this year yeah, I I'm definitely on board with the Michael Thomas one. Uh, I just I don't see it. I I can't. I I saw the video that came out, but he can't. He looked awful. Yeah, he can't <laughs> he cut so to the bad. left. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he couldn't do he anything. Couldn't cut left. Uh, uh, one so, other guy that I have no exposure on is Cam Akers. Interesting. Okay, why why Cam Akers? Um, again, you know, we talked about the Rams a little bit earlier and how they kind of go with this hot hand approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daryl Williams or Daryl, I keep saying Daryl Williams, Daryl Henderson <laughs> is still there. And I think you mean Darnell Anderson touches, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, frankly, I just wasn't really big on cam Akers when he came into the league. I, I okay. never really saw what other people saw on him. Um, and then, you know, he had two games as a rookie that got people really excited because they were at the end of the season. Yeah. And as we know, recency bias plagues fantasy managers every single year. 
Yes. I'm not going to get on a whole Gabe Davis tangent here because I know that's your boy, but I think that <laughs> recency bias is the reason everybody's no, all, I agree. you know, lovey-dovey with Gabe Davis and same with Amon St. Brown and same with Brandon Ayuk two years ago and the same reason that Kyler Murray is a great value this year. It's like people, for some reason, only remember what they see over the last few weeks of the season and that's why Cam Akers was just vaulted into this, like, you know, can't-miss prospect coming into last year and then, of course, he injured himself and he looked like, hot garbage when he came back last year and yeah. i realize now he's a little bit further removed from that injury but i just think it's going to be much more of a frustrating committee in in los angeles than him getting the 30 touches per game that people thought that he'd get last year no i i can agree i mean i i don't mind him because he's going to be fully recovered from the uh from the Achilles he's you know he came back a little earlier which everyone gave him that you know like oh my god you're back I think you'll be okay I think the only reason why I would be low on him is more the line that offensive line is Whitworth is gone yeah and and I I keep having that same argument with Ezekiel Elliott too is you know you're losing big parts of the line and you you lost Saffold years ago you know, you lost, you know, Whitworth this year. You're going to be – you lost Colbert too. You lost a bunch of guys that are just the reason why you did so well at one point. Now, granted, not Acres, but other – you know, their run game in general. I, I just don't see it. They did draft uh, – what's his face? Williams. But he's not even good at, pa- you know, pass blocking, so he might not play that much. The, the other thing I want to say about Williams, though, is like, yeah, he slid in the draft, but you got to remember the Rams had no first round pick. Yeah. Like they didn't no, have any picks. No, I get that. So he was still, he was their third pick. So clearly yeah. they wanted to address the running back situation because they used their third pick on Kyron Williams. And and I don't think that he's a world beater by any chance. But no, you know, with Daryl Henderson there, Jake Funk there, I mean, there oh is God, a Jake little Funk. bit more of a, a crowded room than I think people people realize. And Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me one bit if they end up bringing somebody else in this offseason. You know, if Giovanni Bernard gets cut from Tampa Bay, like we talked about earlier, I could see him landing in Los Angeles. I just I, I don't think that Cam Akers is going to live up to his current draft stock getting drafted in the third, fourth round. Interesting. Yeah, I, I can see it. And, you know, one of the biggest guys for me that I'm low on is, like I said, Ezekiel Elliott. And it's mostly because of the line. And I understand that he's coming back from injury and everyone wanted to talk about, you know, what, you know, Tony Pollard and all that. I know you're a little higher on Ezekiel Elliott and I'm kind of wondering why. And it's, it kind of, I'm not going to get swayed because I I don't feel like, like it's going to, I don't think a lot of what you might say is going to change it, but it's mainly because of the concept that, like I said, I, I know his line is beat up. They didn't draft anybody that I think is anywhere close to what they had Connor Williams you know uh Lennon Collins like those two guys were big parts of that line mm-hmm. and I'm also low I'm just low on anybody on the da- on Dallas in general not the only one I'm not is is Dalton Schultz and I it, the reason being for me is one Tyron Smith barely played last year he was and when he was in he didn't look great when he was out he uh Dak looked like crap so I already lost half the Cowboy uh, viewers on here, which is fine. And that's just Dustin. So I'm fine with that. Um, but at the same time, I'm sitting there and I'm like, if you only have Zach Martin and Dak is back and you've seen the numbers with Dak with Tyron Smith out, I can't see the numbers for CD Lamb going up. I can't see anything because of the concept that he's going to have to be against the one. He's going to have to do everything he can to get the ball out quick. I just, I don't see it. And Zeke then running behind that line, I don't see it either. So what, what try to change my mind, but I, I, I doubt you can, but try. I just, I, I think your Giants fandom might be clouding your vision a little bit. I mean, last okay. year, this team was eighth in rushing yards. They were second in passing yards and they're, I mean, the, the, I understand why, why you don't like them. Um, but, but I just think that this is just a, a fantasy powerhouse. I think right now with Dak Prescott sliding like outside of top 10 QB conversation is ludicrous. And again, oh my gosh, I'm just going to keep saying it. Recency bias. Like Dak Prescott was terrible down the stretch. He helped so many fantasy managers get into the playoffs. And then when they needed him most in the playoffs, he was terrible. And he was putting up like 11, 12 points per game. And I think that's why people have soured on Dak Prescott. 
But um, no, I think this is still going to be. I mean, they were they they led the league in offensive yards per game last year. Like I said, second in passing yards, eighth in rushing yards. This team gets it done in every single facet. And um, now with Amari Cooper out of the picture, I think the passing game is going to be a little bit more consolidated. So I love C.D. Lamb now that he's going to get a chance to be a little bit more versatile, play in the slot and play out wide. You already talked about like in Dalton Schultz. Um, I'm actually a, a big Z guy just because prior to his PCL injury last year, he was crushing it and yeah. then he got hurt. And I think he did him a, he did himself a disservice sure. by playing through the injury because he clearly wasn't hundred percent and he just kept muscling through it and not putting up great production. So people look at his overall numbers and they say, well, his efficiency has plummeted. When, if you look at him when he was healthy in the first four weeks of the season, he was actually playing some of the best football in his life. He had trimmed down. He was quick. He was getting more involved in the passing game. So, Zeke is still, what, 26 years old, I believe? I mean, he yeah, is not so. old. He, he just turned 26 years old. He's still relatively young. And, I mean, if we're going to fade Zeke for his age, then we got to fade Dalvin Cook and Leonard yeah. Fournette and Austin Eckler and, and pretty much and every Barker. other. Yeah. Exactly. They're all around the same age. And I think it's crazy to think that Zeke just falls off the age cliff. And I realize he's got some more mileage on his body than some of these other backs. The last thing I'll say about Zeke, though, Regardless of how well Tony Pollard plays, Tony Pollard is never going to pass Zeke up on the depth chart. It's just not going to happen because of Jerry Jones. And, you know, people are trying to moneyball this situation and say, well, look at how efficient Tony Pollard is. It does not matter. Jerry Jones is giving Zeke $80 million, yeah, and he is going that. to make sure that Ezekiel Elliott earns every penny of that contract. Go look at Emmett Smith in his final years with the uh, with the Dallas Cowboys. 30, 31, 32 years old, he was still getting 250 to 280 carries per season. I mean, yeah. Jerry Jones is just going to make sure that Zeke gets fed. The guy's got a freaking feed me tattoo on his stomach. You better <laughs> believe that they're going to feed him. Oh, no, for sure. It's one of those things. It might be a little bit of my, uh, my Giants – but at the same time, I've always, I've actually, I owned Amari Cooper for most of last year. I traded him away. Just uh, my salary cap dynasty league, he was just too much money. And I needed to kind of clear some cap. But at the same time, I've had, I have Michael Gallup on my team for five bucks. I'm able to keep him for a little bit, you know. So for me, I, I don't mind the Dallas offense. It's just, I, I see, I don't see someone like Lamb doing well. You know, because I think that Cooper took away from Lamb, like whatever people were putting on, you know, the the number one DB is going with Cooper 99% of the time. Now they have to switch it. Now, I understand that Cooper was out for, you know, at least four games last season and, you know, Lamb took over. He did OK by himself, but it's a very, very small sample size for him on his own. And. I just I don't see him with the production and he doesn't have a number two to kind of give him a little bit of space other than Dalton Schultz, which I understand he's good. I like Dalton Schultz. He'll get a ton of volume. I, that's why I'm high on him. But you have Tolbert, who is coming in, Jalen Tolbert, who could maybe take that second role that, you know, I. That's what they keep saying. They keep talking also, I mean, about. it looks like Gallup is going to be ready for week one, too. Those have been the reports. Ooh, so Really? Yeah, and, and I know you know a couple of weeks ago, um, it, Doc, it didn't remember, sound good, and now no. it seems like they they've changed it up pretty quickly. I mean, the reports that I've read are saying that at worst he's going to miss one or two games, but that they're hopeful he'll really? be ready for week one. Because they, I, from what I when I was listening yesterday with the whispers, and I was listening to Doc Evelyn, he he was saying him coming back any time before. Uh, I think his injury was in December. Yeah, but he had surgery in, I think, January. And mm -hmm. that's where the timeline kind of pushes him that the like nine, nine months. Ten months, right. Is, so and, September. And October. Likely. Exactly. Yeah. And the, well, mm -hmm. but that's to that's to to begin or to start rehabbing to a, you know, that being back Sports. on the field. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I personally don't, you know, from what I'm gathering from everybody that I keep reading, keep seeing. He's probably not playing until end of October, and that's just my. I, I'm I'm being a little bit less of an optimist. I I think that he might be a little bit later, so I don't understand why people draft him before they draft Tolbert. You know, because I I feel like Tolbert's going to be playing a lot more, and I think he might have a more of a role. I, I could be completely wrong, but yeah. it's just 
it, it's just what I keep seeing and what I, after I heard that it made me feel that way. Now I have, I, I, I still think Gallup is a very talented receiver, but for me, I, I, I got to look at Mark Harmon's uh, uh, reception perception where, you know, what routes he likes to take. And if I look, it's probably just the nine route down the edge. Um, Cause Tolbert, yeah. no, not Tolbert uh, Gallup. Cause oh, Gallup no. just seems to be that deep route guy. No, I, he is such a clean route runner. I, yeah. I, I, I've always, yeah, I, I've, I mean, I've got tweets from from years ago saying that I, <laughs> I thought, you know, Michael Gallup would have been wide receiver one on like ten or twelve different NFL teams a couple oh, wow. years ago. I, I'm a huge, huge Gallup fan. Yeah, I mean, he's a, uh, I think he's got like the makeup and the build to be an alpha receiver, and um, you know, and everybody's going gung ho about C.D. Lamb, and I'm so bummed that Gallup is coming off this injury because I think the Gallup, you know. I don't think the talent gap between CD Lamb and Gallup is really that big at all. Interesting. Yeah, because they paid him. I mean, they paid him a good amount. I mean, they gave him a good five year deal. I mean, they they still and they got rid of Cooper to keep him. So mm-hmm. I I They've completely understand it. Oh no, they definitely do, and that's why I took him. You know, I traded for him uh, beginning of last or two seasons ago. Uh, unfortunately, I. I traded too much away and didn't get Justin Jefferson or Antonio Gibson, but that's another story for another day. Um, so, yeah, it's okay though. I ended up getting Josh Allen for like five bucks and I am completely okay with that. Um, well, I'll try to find this one video and send it to you, but there's, there's yeah. a clip that I, I saw when I was look, watching a game back uh, from, from two years ago where Michael Gallup, he just runs one of the filthiest routes I've ever seen. And then he elevates like this man flies through the air. He looks, I like know all oh, that. Uh, you probably know the play that I'm talking oh, about. Yeah. And it's just when I saw that, I just became such a huge Michael Gallup fan. Yeah, I, I've seen all. Well, that's why I said, like, I, everything I see is just him being on a nine route with a deep ball where he can just go up and get it better than anybody else. And just everywhere around him, you know, it, he just can catch it. But I've never seen him just, you know, doing a quick post route or doing like these different routes where he's used more like on a slant route or like any, it's always on the sideline out or, you know, or downfield. I've never seen him get anything else, you know, and he's not really a big volume guy. I think the most targets he had in one, you know, one season, I think it was like seven targets or no, no, the one game where he had like 12 and then he only caught like seven of them, you know, things like that. But I could, like I said, a lot of my giants bias here too. Uh-huh. I just I just sent you this oh, you video did. on Twitter that yeah. you can check out where he looks like he's going in and then he runs a route outside, shakes the Washington defender. And yeah. I'm not kidding. He looks like Michael Jordan. I mean, this guy, he, he's 15 feet away, jumps up and then gets both of his toes down. I mean, it's just it, it's unbelievable the body control that he's got. No, that's awesome. I think that's one reason why I'm a big fan of Darnell Mooney as well, which I know you're high on as well. I think Mooney is going to be great. I just I'm a little concerned about the concept of him being the only guy. You know, like think about who he's there. I understand you're even high on Colmet, uh, Comet as, as well. I, am I higher reason. on Mooney? I, I thought I was below consensus on Mooney. I don't maybe, maybe his consensus ranking has shifted a little bit, but I believe I'm I'm below. Um, oh. consensus well, either way, Mooney. how do you feel about Mooney in general? Just your own, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think you were already kind of tiptoeing around a little bit, but I think I think yeah. he's a phenomenal wide receiver too. I just don't think that he's got the makings of being a wide receiver one, um, and that's why you know because I'm fading Mooney a little bit. That's you're why I'm so bit. bullish on Cole Komet. You're just a tad over ECR. You're only by three. Interesting. All right. Well, I'm well, that that's that. by fantasy <laughs> pros, but no, yeah. I was only curious about it because so you feel like it. Okay, so I think that both these teams. Uh, the Cowboys and the Bears in a way they have kind of a similar situation where they have that top guy they have some guy waiting in the wings that might be in in like three weeks with you know Byron Pringle who I I like I I just like the talent um but then you have Cole Komet there a good you know good tight end good receiving tight end same with Schultz and then a better quarterback of course with Dak do you think that he can handle those you know number one you know corners and do what he can to to be able to be that low end wide receiver one. I mean, his floor is probably what wide receiver three. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that he's just a very safe guy, but I don't think that he really has much of a ceiling at all. And, yeah. and I think like he's going to put up low end wide receiver two numbers. And I think his ceiling is high end wide receiver two. Okay. No, that's fair. Uh, that's a fair assessment. I, I haven't really touched him in a lot of drafts um, here and there where I'm kind of like, I have no other choice. 
you know, where I have yeah. like a, you know, I pick chase in the beginning and then I need that too. And it's just, everyone's gone by then. Uh, or if I go running back heavy, if I need to, um, one other team that I was kind of curious about and how you feel about is the new England, the new England offense. No more Josh, you know, McDaniels, he's going to Vegas. You got Joe Judge leading the passing offense. Yeah, Patricia leading the run offense. Like this whole new Bill Checkian weird thingamajig that he's trying to do here. Are you on board with anybody over here? Um, yeah, I mean Jacoby Myers is a guy that I'm I'm really liking. Um, you know, pulled like a top 20 target share last year. And yeah. had he just stumbled into the end zone a couple of times, I think people would be looking at him as a top 25, <laughs> top 30 receiver. But yeah. um, I, I think he had two touchdowns on the season. Yeah, two. Maybe one. He finally had two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I didn't I play him. The reason. <laughs> and, and so I, I'm still in on him. Another guy that I'm still on, and this is going to sound crazy, but it's just kind of a cost thing. You can get this guy for free at the very end of your draft. Johnny Smith. Um, you know, there was a ton of hype for Johnny coming in the last off season failed to live up to it but i'm hoping that another year with the organization you know he can just kind of find his 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 footing there i mean they're paying the guy 50 million dollars they're gonna have to find out something some sort of role wow. for him um so john who's a guy that i'm throwing late darts at and then mac jones is a guy that i've kind of been fading all off season but i had a uh i, I had nate Liss on my show yesterday and he sold me on mac jones pretty pretty well um if you look at the you know his his peripherals his intended air yards and his accuracy and all that he was putting up almost identical yards or almost identical numbers to Joe Burrow. The difference is Joe Burrow has Jamar Chase, yeah. somebody who's going to rip off these yards after the catch. And the Patriots don't have anybody like that. So, um, you know, basically the the, the argument that um, Nate was making and I fully bought into is if the Patriots can get a guy next year like Keishon Booty or, or Jackson Smith the Jigba, they bring in that big time playmaker. It could elevate elevate Mac Jones into being an elite fantasy producer as well. Um, and, and I was just kind of mind blown when I started looking at some of his efficiency metrics and uh, I, I mean, you, you can check them out yourself. The, the only difference was the yards after the catch that Joe Burrow had, but just about everything else, Mac Jones and Joe Burrow were in lockstep. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, I I've beginning of last year, wasn't as high on Mac Jones just because the whole narrative of, you know, the Alabama quarterback first round pick, blah, 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 blah. Wasn't really behind it. Then I got to see what he could do. You know, I saw his accuracy. I was a lot higher on him than, you know, uh, Justin Fields and a few others. So I, I was, I felt okay about Mac Jones in general. That just kind of pushed me over a little bit. Um, I feel like that means someone like Devontae Parker who came in might do well. Um, I, I like Devontae Parker as a receiver. I think that, you know, I know Jacoby Myers is, well, then I have to ask this question. Do you think Myers is still the one compared to Devontae Parker coming in? I like Devontae Parker, but he's just getting up there in age. And I think what's going to be frustrating is Devontae Parker is going to be used predominantly as an end zone, um, you know, red zone type of threat. And that's really going to make it tough for Jacoby Myers. Okay, that's fair. No, that's completely fair. I got Rafi Bomb here. Good old Rafi Bomb. I love Rafi. Um, thoughts on uh, Lawrence no longer playing in the circus in Jacksonville? Um, sorry, my my dog. No, it's are okay. Ballistic right now. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think that they, I think he's going to be much better. Um, Trevor Lawrence is a guy that I'm I'm buying um, at at his cost in both dynasty and redraft. There's nowhere to go but up, and and he did the hard things that you don't see a lot of rookies doing, which are hitting the intermediate throws. You know, you always see rookies that are excelling throwing to the outside, throwing deep, throwing short. Trevor Lawrence was hitting the really tough throws in the middle of the field, so I I, I think that there's going to be a huge opportunity for him to bounce back, especially having his sidekick from college, Clemson. He's got Travis Etienne there to really work as a safety blanket. He checked down at the highest rate of any quarterback in the league next year last year and now he gets etn back with him this year so I'm, I'm i'm really excited about lawrence yeah i've been trying to grab him a little bit everywhere in best ball drafts trying to get a little bit you know more on top you know more on board with him i try to grab him every so often in you know super flex mocks i do i feel the same way i you know he has a great supporting cast i i think christian kirk is very underrated for you know i understand they paid him a lot of money and everyone's like why the hell did they pay him he's not a bad receiver <laughs> Like he, he, he was the number two behind, you know, DeAndre Hopkins and he's still a, I think he's a talent. He's very good at what he does. He's quick. And I've always been on board with him. Uh, he's just been underutilized in Arizona. 
I love Marvin Jones. I know he's old. I don't care. I still love what he can do and puts up numbers every year. Very consistent. I love Evan Ingram. I'm on board. I, you know, I've always been on board with him. And even what Trevor Lawrence was able to do with what James O'Shaughnessy and, you know, Dan Arnold. So I, I feel very comfortable with him. And then now, like you said, he has ETN. So even with everything going on in that running back room, there's a name that consistently keeps coming up. And I think, I, I think you know where I'm going to go with this, but it's Snoop Connor. No, not no, on board. Not do it. No, James okay. Robinson is such a great running back. You know, he's going to immediately take his role back when he's there. ETN is going to play as the passing down guy. I just don't think there's any room for Snoop Connor in this backfield. Okay. Yeah, I was listening to um, uh, John Shipley, I think his name is. Uh, he's one of the beat reporters for the Jags, yeah. and I was listening to him on the uh, – I think he was on the Diehards or Elite Sports, one of the two. And uh, – no, he was on Diehards with Bob Harris. And – when he was talking about this backfield, he was saying that the one knock on ETN and the only knock that he has in this compared to someone like James Robinson is pass catching or uh, pass blocking. Mm -hmm. So it might hurt him a tad, but not as much as people might think. And they might use him more at wide receiver or at least in slot, you know, just moving him out of there. And just the nice thing throws. though is, is Lawrence is he's strong and mobile. Yeah, so you don't really need an elite pass blocker. It's not the same situation like when we were talking about the Buccaneers yeah. earlier, where you got Tom Brady, Tom Brady who's just yeah. this decrepit statue standing in the pocket. <laughs> you know, it's Trevor Lawrence can he, he can knock a defender down. He can he can move. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's that's always been the knock on Etienne. But also, I, I think especially once James Robinson comes back, we'll see a lot of not necessarily two back sets because they won't be lined up as backs. But mm -hmm. I think that we can see James Robinson in the backfield blocking and then Etn lining up in line yeah. or in the slot. No, I can I can see that too. And you know, you could also go off of you know Doug Peterson and how they you know he used his running backs. You know, he he's able to spread them out, and you know he definitely likes using multiple backs. So we'll get to see how that goes. I'm kind of interested either way. I'm a little nervous about uh robinson's timetable i know they said that he'll be back by training camp but we'll have to wait and see how that goes um so we'll have to wait and see um all right i think that's all i have for you i've kept you way too long and it's okay i know that you'd rather just talk football all night and that's fine but i don't want to keep you too long um i want to make sure that i let our viewers know to make sure that you guys like and subscribe to the channel. I know that I have it above here, but make sure you guys check below. There's the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Make sure you guys are doing all that. Help us out. Help the channel. Also, if you don't have Sleeper, make sure you get it. I mean, I, I, I am not endorsed by Sleeper in any shape, way, or form. And Dave can tell you, get it. It is worth having if you don't already have it. We, You can, uh, in our description below, we have the link to our private sleeper channel. We have a great community of people that are in there that are always talking football. I'm in there all the time. I try to get you guys the best injury news when we can, when we get into the beginning of the season or in season, uh, I try to get it to before sleepier, uh, before sleeper. Uh, I got an 80% hit rate, but we'll, we'll see how that goes this year. Um, you know, now that I have Twitter, <laughs> it's, it's a dark rabbit hole. Um, other than that, Dave, I really do appreciate you being here today. Um, I really, honestly, uh, we were talking before the show, just really enjoyed um, everything, you know, that you've given to me here. Uh, let the folks know about things that you're going to be working on or anything that might be uh, coming up for you in the next, you know, whenever. Yeah, uh, really simple. You can find all my written content and video content at footballguys.com. Um, and then on Twitter, you can see where I'm guesting on shows, you know, takes I've got videos that I'm dropping and all that. You can find me on Twitter at Dave Kluge. That's Dave K L U G E. Awesome. Yeah. Always, always a great thing. And and I've been following you for, you know, the last few months. Uh, and, well, yeah, maybe last month <laughs> I haven't really been on Twitter long, but, uh, the minutes that I've been on there, I've been enjoying everything that you have. And I really do appreciate you coming on to the show today. Uh, being able to help our viewers uh, with a lot of things, and uh, yeah, I hope to have you hope uh, hope to have you here again, and uh, yeah. So, thanks again for Dave being here. For the rest of Get Right Nation, thank you so much. We will be back here on Monday. We're going to be grading these mocks. See how see how Dave did against our best that we have here, and uh, 
my crappy team. So I'm already, I don't get to grade my team. Thank God. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for being here. We'll see you on Monday. Bye.